Hi there. Uh, thanks for joining us on a, a Friday night. Welcome to Pandemic and Protests, a night of storytelling about life during COVID-19 and the fight for racial equality. We are really glad that you are here tonight. Uh, I'm Jennifer Wing with KNKX Public Radio, and I am happy to be here tonight to host the event along with Paul Currington of Fresh Ground Stories, and a big shout out to Melissa Reeves of Story Fruition, who brought us many of tonight's storytellers through Melanin Stories Matter. Both Paul and Melissa coach the stories uh, and the storytellers that you will hear tonight. It's a very collaborative, process and we are very grateful for their expertise. Uh, just a couple of programming notes before we get underway. Tonight's event is being recorded and if you would like to comment on Twitter, our Twitter, our Twitter handle is at KNKXFM. Now, while we would all like to be together here on Zoom or in the same room, unfortunately we are on Zoom, but there is a silver lining here. We are able to bring you tellers from all over the country, from here all the way to Puerto Rico. Now, before we get started, I do want to mention today's date. This is 9-11, a date we chose on purpose. It was a date 19 years ago. This country went through some very difficult uh, times, like we are going through right now. We have raging forest fires, we have a pandemic, and we have millions of people in this country and all over the world protesting against racial injustice and reminding us that Black Lives Matter. So let's begin pandemic and protest with a story from Sasha M. Sasha lives in Seattle and she was coached for the story by Paul. Uh, in January, her fiance started obsessing about some virus in China and she started to wonder if uh, this was the man that she wanted to spend the rest of her life with. Hi everybody. My fiance Jeremy and I were pretty happy together. And then COVID-19 happened and I started questioning, is this the person I really wanna marry? Is this the person I wanna be quarantined with? Jeremy first learned about the coronavirus back in January and he immediately went into action. He bought a bunch of masks, he stopped seeing his friends, he became uncomfortable going into his office. Now, keep in mind that it wasn't until March 23rd that stay-at-home orders became official. Jeremy was about two months ahead. When people hear the story now, they say things like, oh, Jeremy was smart. But back when it was happening, hardly anyone took him seriously. In fact, most of us thought he was going insane. It didn't help that he was flooding his Facebook wall with posts about how this virus was going to infect millions of people and devastate the economy. No one likes the messenger bearing bad news. He got into a lot of arguments. He even got banned from a Reddit forum after suggesting that people stay away from their workplaces for the next couple of months. Yeah, good luck with that, buddy, someone said before shutting him down. I had a different approach to all of this. I work as a web producer, but I also teach yoga part-time. And most of the people that I know through yoga tend to be really confident about their health, maybe a little overconfident. We say things like yoga is the best medicine. And if someone gets a cold or the flu, one of my favorite teachers would say, come to yoga, sweat it out. And then she'd crank up the heat to 110 degrees. Now, I realize that what she said hasn't aged well, but before COVID-19, I was living by these words. I loved sweating things out and being with these teachers who were always so cheerful. No matter what was going on, they had the glass half full mentality. And then they took that further. They said, look, the glass is refillable. Here's more water. Meanwhile, Jeremy was sinking further and further into his COVID black hole. You know, he usually has a big, easy smile. He likes to joke a lot. But one morning, I woke up to find him with tears in his eyes. He'd just seen a video of an old Chinese man gasping for breath, his wife rubbing his belly. And I said to him, why are you watching that? You are poisoning your mind. You're gonna make yourself sick from all this stress. And stop smoking. Cigarettes are the real threat here. 
he kept watching the growing death toll. I kept trying to refill his glass. How could I get him to see something good? I asked him to be grateful for something, anything, the sun, the rain, the food in our fridge. This worked for a little while, but then he'd get upset anytime he turned on the news or anytime I went out to see my friends. In February, I got invited to a big birthday party. Jeremy urged me not to go. I didn't think we had anything to worry about because the virus was far away. As long as we didn't get on a cruise ship, we'd be fine. I even tried to joke with him. I said, obviously, we have different beliefs about this. It's almost like we're in two different political parties. You're a skinny ball version of Arnold Schwarzenegger. I'm an Asian American middle class Maria Shriver. There's a gap here and we're just going to have to agree to disagree. I went to the party, had a great time, but when I got back, I saw Jeremy sulking in bed. The room was dark, but I could tell he was still awake. He suddenly shouted, you're my vector of disease. You expose yourself to countless people. <sighs> what a killjoy. I said, Jeremy, I think you love this virus. You love it and you pour all your energy into it. No, he said, you don't get it. I asked you to marry me because I wanna dedicate my life to you, but you are risking both of our lives. You know, no yoga class, no birthday party is worth that. I had trouble going to, going to sleep that night. I kept trying to, I kept thinking about what he said. You know, it'd be one thing if I caught the virus, but it would be horrible if I passed it on to him. The next few days, my feelings for Jeremy became as volatile as the stock market. I'd wake up feeling down about our relationship. And then by afternoon, my feelings would rally. And then by evening, they would dip again. I kept wondering, should I stay? Should I let him go? And if I let him go, will I see his stock rising again with someone else and regret what I lost what could have been and why couldn't i have been with someone carefree you know someone like brian a yoga teacher who walks around shirtless all day who thinks he's protected from the virus because he burns sage in his apartment and rubs essential oils into his chest but if i really dug deeply the reason we were together was that i like jeremy a lot more than i like most other people and amazingly, that feeling was mutual. In the end, the choice was clear. COVID-19 is a serious threat, but it didn't kill our relationship. And as the virus raged on, my friends and I realized, oh, Jeremy's not crazy. He was actually an early adopter. Quarantine became a blessing in disguise for us. We've gotten to know each other super well. I know when he needs to eat, when he farts, how often he smokes. I love everything about him except for his cigarettes. Most importantly, we found joy again. We learned how to refill our glasses. Thank you. Oh, Sasha, that was amazing. Thank you so much. And I gotta say, I think if your fiance had been in the White House uh, in January, instead of your apartment in North Seattle, we wouldn't have to do this show, right? I think this would all have been taken care of. Uh, I do have one request, request, please, please insert a little bit of this story into your wedding vows. I would love to hear the minister say, Jeremy, do you take this vector of disease to be your lawfully wedded <laughs> wife? Please let this happen. <laughs> Thank you. Our next storyteller, also from Seattle, Abby Ekenezer. She was coached by Melissa. And Abby does a million things. Among the many things, she's an activist, she's a veteran, and her storyteller, it's about a time when, uh, during a protest, she came in contact with a police officer, and it, her military training kicked in in that moment, and it really made her think, who is the enemy here? It's 9-11, and I've just canceled breakfast with my best friend, Greg who went to work on the 97th floor at the World Trade Center. Because I had a surprise quiz at uni 
I'm in the train station going from New Jersey, leaving my overnight job at 7.30 a.m. and I just got to school. I finished taking my economics test and I turned on my mobile only to have received 30 missed calls and voicemails from my friends telling me that the World Trade Center was just attacked. I run down the student center to see the news because I couldn't believe it. And it's showing on the screen over and over again. Three months later, after searching for my friend, we finally found his remains and were able to bury him. In June of the following year, I joined the Navy. I just wanted to make sure that 9-11 never happened again. I am a veteran. I served two tours in Djibouti and Afghanistan in 2007. And I'm in Navy boot camp when they tear gas us for the first time. They teach us this to make sure that if we're ever in a situation by the enemy, if we get tear gas, we actually know how to handle ourselves. And this only happened to me once while I was on active duty. On May 25th, 2020, I am watching a death blue knee. I am watching a death blue knee pressing upon a begging black neck. This causes a deep outrage within myself and the rest of the world. This has not only happened once, but so many other times with so many other people of color, especially right here in our own state. May 30th, 2020, I'm in Westlake with my friends. One of them is Lucio. I call him my bear because he is massive and 6'3". He is Espanyard, but he's also white passing and he's there to protect us and make sure that we are all safe whilst showing his support. He met up with me and my friends and we all chant together the names of so many that have lost their lives due to police brutality. Rodney King, Charlena Lyles, Aubrey Abrams, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Jacob Blake, and recently, who is now paralyzed. So many different chants we say, just to show that we are peaceful. Unfortunately, we are met with forceful opposition. The Seattle Police Department, through flashbangs, tear gas, and rubber bullets into our crowd, why? Because they couldn't separate us from the blonde woman that decided to set a police car on fire with hairspray and a lighter. My friend, Britannia, is a saint. She already has a water and baking soda solution ready for those to pour into the eyes who have been exposed to tear gas. I myself got a mouthful, mouthful of gas and I felt the flashbangs go over my head. And all of a sudden I'm back in Afghanistan. I've got Kevlar on and watching my commander run around yelling that we are all going to die. And I think, I'm not there. I'm in Seattle. I'm home. I'm home. I have friends with me that need me to take care of them. So I snap out of it, trying to breathe whilst moving my friends to the back because there are protest virgins within themselves. But I continue to fight. I say to my friends, Britannia and I will meet you back here because we want to go to the front lines. I'm still reeling from previous bouts of tear gas as we trek forward to look at those individuals who kept treating us like the enemy. Why aren't you protecting us? I tried looking in their eyes or seeing their faces, but they're completely covered in riot gear. Cowards. They throw tear gas at us again and again, and we unfortunately have to fall back to meet up with our friends. I look at my phone and I see a text from Lucio. He was maced in the face while protecting a group of people in the very front, and he has to go home. I look at my watch and it's 5.15. And Mayor Durkin, who allowed us to protest originally, sent us to our rooms. I feel sad and betrayed. It's June 6, 2020, and I'm facing another protest. I accumulate more protest virgins who are the chorus of my very own Greek tragedy. Am I going to war? Yes, I am. 
peacefulness at first, and then we charge in. I look into the crowd and all I see are armored guards. We push on, they retreat, and we establish CHAZ, Capitol Hill Autonomous Zone. Well, the residents didn't really want to call it that. They didn't want to be a separate entity from the United States of America. So we opt for the name CHOP, Capitol Hill Occupied Protest Zone. And this place, it's beautiful. One event we had out of so many different ones is called a blackout. That was when the people that were our allies protected the outside doors and gates at Cal Anderson Park and only allowed people of color to, to go in, to breathe, to have fun, to enjoy each other, to have discussions, to have a safe place. We made history. We're finally making change. And that's why I protest. Thank you. Abby, thank you so much for that beautiful story. And thank you for your service. Um, Abby, you are an actress, a singer, a cosplayer, and, uh, and also a filmmaker. So thank you again for sharing your story tonight. Our third storyteller is also from Seattle, and he was coached uh, by Paul. Opie Pressman took the Harvard implicit bias test before and during and after a Peace Corps assignment in Namibia, and he found the results a little troubling. The implicit association test, or the IAT, was created by a team at Harvard to measure our unconscious biases from neutral to strong. When I learned about the IAT in 2005, I decided I wanted to take the most famous test, black people versus white people. I've been volunteering at an after school program for underserved youth, and it had highlighted a certain amount of discomfort I felt around issues of race. And I was kind of unsettled by that. So I got online, took the test, and the results came back slightly biased towards white people. And rather than really contemplate what that meant for me personally, I kind of just sidestepped the whole thing by congratulating myself on being less biased than the average American, as most are at least moderately biased towards white people. Three years later, I'm a year into my service as a Peace Corps volunteer in Namibia. I'm at a mid-service conference with all my fellow volunteers. And it's there that my friends and I start joking that living in Namibia is making us racist against white people. Let me unpack that. Namibia is a post-apartheid country. And unlike in South Africa, there was never a truth and reconciliation process. As a result, it seemed to me that every white Namibian that I met still carried that legacy with them, whether they acknowledged it or not. And I think because Peace Corps volunteers were outsiders, we could see that in a way that they couldn't. In my community, almost everyone around me, my colleagues, my friends, people I respected, people I loved, were almost all varying shades of brown. And I was contemplating this after the conference and it dawns on me, oh, I should take the IAT again. So I get online and take the test and my results come back as moderately biased towards black people. And at the time, this makes perfect sense to me because I can think about Edwin, who's not only my boss at the Ministry of Youth, he's also a reverend, a cattle herder, and one of the most decent and dignified people I have ever met in my life. Or I can think about Festus, who's my coworker. And when we first met, I didn't think that he liked me and I didn't even know whether I even liked him. But as we got to know each other, we warmed up and we became really good friends. And every holiday, he would invite me back to his parents' homestead way out in the bush. Or I could think about Shinyo, who when we met at a barbecue 
and her eyes locked over all that grilling meat, it was as if our friendship had a love at first sight. Two years later, I'm back in Seattle, I'm at work, and we're taking sessions on diversity and inclusion. And they ask us to take the IAT. And I think, great, chance to bring this whole thing full circle. Perfect. So I get online and I take the test. There's a lot more debate now than there was then regarding the accuracy of a single IAT. Although there's little debate about what it reveals in aggregate about this country. But if I was being honest with myself, I didn't need a test to know what the results were gonna be. I remember when I first returned to Seattle and I saw someone of African descent, my heart would leap because it felt like, oh, 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 there's my people. And I couldn't help but express that happiness and excitement outward towards them. And invariably, or almost invariably, they would respond. And yet, I felt that feeling fade until it disappeared. And with it, so did those interactions. When I got my test results back, they were moderately biased towards white people. And it's not that there weren't black people or people of color in my life, there were. And it's not like I should have been biased one way or another, ideally but I didn't live in a vacuum. And there are realities and legacies in this country and not just Namibia that informed my subconscious otherwise. And to see that intangible form in myself was really humbling. And it was this reminder that I am what I attend to, that what surrounds me inevitably shapes how I see and respond to the world, whether I like it or not. And that's why I need to seek other out and to celebrate difference, because that is what will keep me open to all the possibilities that this world has to offer. When I left Namibia, on the last day I was in my town of service, Shinyo came to me and he said, I feel like there's always been a place for you in my heart and I've always just been waiting for you to come fill it. Thank you. Obi, thank you so much for that story. That is as beautiful as it was when I first heard it three years ago. Thank you for your, your honesty and uh, your vulnerability in, in talking about that and reminding us we have to be conscious about what we're doing now. You know, we have to do some difficult things and we have to be mindful about doing them or they won't get done. And I know that you are as frustrated as I am that your story is just, well, it's even more relevant than it was three years ago. So thank you, my friend, keep telling it. Our next storyteller is Christina Diaz coming to us all the way from the beautiful island of Puerto Rico, San Juan, Puerto Rico. She was coached by Melissa. Now, Christina, has always embraced all the different shades uh, of skin color in her family. But when she was growing up, she realized that not all of the people in her culture did that. Some of them did not embrace the darker tones. And that is why she's telling us this story tonight. Hi, uh, some context for my story. I am Latina, which is not my race, but my ethnicity. It's an identifier that connects me to a whole group of people through the history of my language. I'm Puerto Rican. I live on an island surrounded by big water. And like many families, I grew up in the bubble that makes us believe that we are Puerto Rican and we can be nothing else. Even if our family, or is like most families, has all the colors. Mine is no exception. My dad is chocolate, mom is cream of wheat, my grandmother was caramel, her mother was a glass of milk, and abuelo negro, definitely dark chocolate. <laughs> so I guess that makes me a caramel mocha frappuccino. And in spite of the national pride we islanders have, and the multi-flavored families we enjoy, there is this saying that goes around, Mary Light, to improve the race. And although it's not the only saying like that here, that one has often come to mind. 
my titi Sara, who was a sweet date, she broke that rule and married an 80% dark chocolate man and had five caramel chocolate kids. I met them for the first time when I was 17. The gate creaked as they walked up the porch with their rolling suitcases. And our chihuahuas ran to the door, jumping up and down to say hello. And Clotilde, our youngest cousin, she screamed and ran back out the gate and toward the car saying, no, 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 no. And we, we didn't know what to do. So we secured the pups in the backyards. And as we sat down and reassured her, she told us, when I was a little girl walking to school in Washington, D.C., there were neighborhoods we had to run through because our white neighbors would open their doors and unleash their dogs to chase and bite us. And then I find myself watching TV President Donald Trump all smiles, waving his tangerine hands, talking about protesters in Washington, D.C., and he says, we'll sick the dogs on them. Why would you weaponize man's best friend this way? Four years later, I'm in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm 21 years old, and I'm attending a national youth church conference. There are 35,000 kids there. And out of those 35,000, 2% people of color. During this conference, me and three high school delegates attend an assembly. And our sitting assignment is in the back of the large hotel ballroom. In the front, kids are arguing about why there should be intentional positions for people of color on the leadership board. And in the front of the ballroom, a little girl stands up. She was a 14 year old cup of strawberry yogurt with curly blonde hair. And without skipping a beat, she said, what more do these niggers want? We've already given them their freedom. Six years later, I'm in Buenos Aires, Argentina in South America. I'm working as an RA for student housing in the dorms, we have students from all over Argentina. And in this community of about 30 people and students that I work with, I am the only brown person. The phone rings, and there's been an incident at one of the female dorms. E was an icebox cake. Her skin was white like fluffy marshmallows and her hair black like Oreo cookies. But there was nothing sweet about what E had done that day. In a flurry of anger, she stripped down her room, pulled things off the walls, dumped her clothes into a suitcase, threw it down a flight of stairs to the first floor. Then before leaving, she opened up her purse, pulled out a condom, spit into it, filled it with all these gross things. And I don't even want to know what it was, but she tied it to the door, slammed it shut and was like, see ya. We gathered the seven remaining housemates in the living room, all students, all women, all white, and everyone took a turn processing out loud what had just happened. Suddenly, Surai, a kind girl with sweet colored hair and soft features, takes a deep breath and she says, I can't believe E would do that. That was such a black thing to do. And I looked at her and said, Surai, I'm black. My family is black. That is not a black thing to do. And in that moment, I became black. If I could go back in time and talk to my 27 year old self, I would say, thank you for being brave and saying something because we aren't born knowing how to respond to situations like these. We aren't even taught about it in school, but I've learned that when we are silent, we do a disservice to those we represent. And I know Surai wasn't directly talking to me when she said that thing, but it mattered. It had a history. And I think back to all the sayings like that one that I've heard growing up, pointing to light being better but I refuse to believe that because being black is not a bad thing. 
and the mocha in my frappuccino is incomplete without the chocolate. These sayings become the stories that are told about people like me. And what we say and where it comes from matters because words have power. They're like spells we cast upon ourselves and others. So as I look back at these stories and all the others in between, I hope they tie themselves to your memory and have the power to change the way you experience the different flavors of your own story. Thank you. Thank you so much for that story, Christina. That was really wonderful. <laughs> Christina learned uh, to love telling stories from her grandmother, uh, her great grandmother, and even her great, great grandmother. <laughs> so thank you again for sharing uh, your perspective and your experience. Up next, uh, Harja Singh lives in Jersey City, New Jersey, and was coached for the story by Melissa. Harjus tells us what it's like having deep pride in his Sikh religion uh, and Indian culture. And he tells us that his heart aches when someone passes judgment, fearing that he might be a threat simply based by the way he looks. I'm five years old. My mom dresses me up nicely in my school uniform. I'm wearing my navy blue shorts, light blue shirt and tie. She combs my hair and ties it in a bun and covers it with a turban. Not quite like the turban that I wear today, but almost like a do-rag that makes the outline of my bun, my Juda, visible. My grandfather drops me off at the bus stop, and right after he leaves, the boys at the stop surround me, hold my Juda in their hands and try and rip it apart like it's a dirty old rag. Is that a tomato on your head? Is that, is that an egg? What if I smash it? Will it break? And this would happen day after day. And every day I would go back home and cry to my mom and ask her, why do I look different? Why can't I be normal like everyone else? And my mom would say, Beta, we are six. The turban is a part of our identity. Our long uncut hair is a part of our identity. It represents existing in the natural form that God created us in. It's a gift given to us by our gurus. And who are you to try and blend in when you were born to stand out? There were two more things my mom told me that day that gave me strength and comfort in who I was. One, if you're better at something than everyone else, then everyone will want to learn from you and not hurt you. And two, always fight for your right, but know that you can't change everyone. So for those who are willing to learn, educate them about your faith with love and compassion. So that's what I did. I started standing up for myself when I needed and started studying as hard as I could. To my surprise, the same people who used to pull my hair and turban at the bus stop would now come to me asking for help with their homework. This defense mechanism of working hard to protect myself compounded over the next 12 years and had a nice side effect that led me to getting admitted in one of the best computer science programs in America. And I was as American as I could be while still being Indian. I could quote friends at the drop of a hat. I'd heard enough Backstreet Boys to give anyone a run for their money. And I was ready for America to beam me up, Scotty. A brand new start a place where I can be accepted for who I am, just like Lady Liberty says. I was going to school in Philly, and by that first night, everyone was talking about the first parties of the year on 35th and Powelton. And my experience of American parties was shaped strongly by my multiple viewings of American Pie. I dressed up looking my fashionable best, I combed and oiled my beard, put on my nicest looking turban, and showed up at the townhouse overflowing with freshmen with red solo cups in their hands just like American Pie. But as someone who doesn't drink, it didn't take me long to realize that house parties were not my scene. And as I tried to make my way out of the crowded hallway, a girl stopped me and said, can I ask you a question? Me? Yes. Are you a terrorist? She said it so unironically that I just stood there dumbstruck for a second. She was genuinely asking me, out of curiosity, are you a terrorist? And this assault on my identity continued in subtle but 
not so subtle ways. Every so often, a car would drive by the driver, and the driver would shout, "Fuck you, Osama!" or "God damn, raghead!" One time, I was stopped at the airport because TSA thought that the jar of pickles I was carrying was an improvised explosive device. And then there was a time when I was waiting for the next bus when a red jeep slowed down near me. The back window rolled down. The person inside threw a crumpled cigarette box at me and drove away. I stood there shaking because it felt like I couldn't be safe anywhere. A year later, on August fifth, two thousand twelve, the Sikh community of Oak Creek, Wisconsin, had gathered together at the Gurdwara for their weekly prayers, just like Sunday church. The prayer was to be followed by langar, the community kitchen where everyone, regardless of religion, gender, sexual orientation, is welcome to a free meal. When Wade Michael Page, an ex-army veteran, walked into the temple with a legally purchased nine-millimeter semi-automatic pistol and opened fire on the men, women, and children gathered there, he killed six people before shooting himself. It was later revealed that he was a white supremacist and often talked about an impending racial holy war. The media insisted that his motives remained unclear and that the mystery had died with him. But ask any Sikh or Muslim, and the motive seems obvious. So maybe it is true. We can't be safe anywhere. The question then is: If I feel so unsafe in America, what has kept me here for nine years? Why continue to stay? It's because, despite its imperfections, America, like all of us, is a work in progress. It is also the kind of country that gives people like us opportunity. You know how they say, "You cannot be what you cannot see." I don't have to look too much further than my own family to see the results of the opportunity America provided, in the form of my two uncles who came here before me, built successful companies, and live beautiful lives with their families. Yes, there is the occasional verbal abuse. Fortunately, no physical abuse, but I get through it because I realize that it's only 0.5 percent of the people doing the shouting. The other 99.5 percent of the people are on my side. And look, given the state of the world today, maybe I'm too optimistic, or maybe I'm too naive to think that the 99.5 percent are with me. But I'd rather believe and live in an America that I know is on my side than be in one that is overrun by bigots and jerks. And like my mom said. You can't change everyone, but for those who are willing to learn, educate them with love and compassion. And hey, I'm more than happy to talk because when you look like I do, it's a great conversation starter. Wow, Harjus, thank you so much for that story and reminding us that this is going to start by leading with love and compassion. That's so important.、Uh, wouldn't it be great if if we all just decided our differences were were We're just great starting points for conversations. That wouldn't that be nice? I do. I feel I should apologize as an American for American Pie.、Uh, I kind of messed you up with that. It's I don't know what movie to compare America to right now. Somewhere between American Pie and Mad Max. I don't. Maybe edging toward Mad Max. We might be close to the Thunderdome right now. I don't know. But I'm glad you're here, my friend. Our final storyteller this evening was coached by Melissa. And is coming to us all the way from Brooklyn. David, a day. I'm so sorry. Devin Sandiford is the father of two sons, age five and eight. And in this story, he tells us about a time when he was trying to get them out to a Black Lives Matter protest. But inside the story, he's also telling us what it means to be a black man in his own neighborhood. Thank you, Paul. Hi everybody. A few months ago, I'm walking down the street, one block away from my home in Brooklyn, New York, with my five and eight-year-old sons, and we're walking down the street, and I'm hoping that there's a crowd of protesters just filling the streets, even in the middle of the pandemic. I'm hoping that it's really crowded, because I want to be a part of something huge, and I want to instill in my sons that we can go out into the world and we can make real change. And so I've dragged them out of the house and. My five-year-old son, who everyone tells us looks like a little John Legend, is standing next to me, holding my hand as we walk. And my eight-year-old, who used to love to hold my hand, no longer likes to hold my hand because apparently eight is grown, and he thinks holding my hand is a punishment. So he's walking in front of us, 
And he's just walking there and all of a sudden I see him like playfully start jabbing, punching in the air. And I hear myself instantly say, stop that. And he looks at me and he's really confused, but I have to tell him that he's, we're not doing that today because we live right next to the Barclay Center where the protesters start or end every night for their protests. And on the other side of our home is New York City Police Department 78th Precinct where the police gear up in their riot gear every night. And our street has been barricaded for at least a week as everybody has come out after a video has gone viral of a human being's life being taken, stolen from the earth by a cop without even an ounce of remorse. And I'm, I'm so motivated to take them outside, even in the middle of the pandemic. And I, I tell my son that he doesn't get to be a kid right now. And as we walk down the street, that hits me really hard because I already know that he's not had a chance to be a kid right now because we're in this middle of this global pandemic and we're in the city hit with the most cases and hit with the most deaths, deaths than any other place in the world. Half a mile away next to our local park, there's refrigerated trucks with dead bodies being put away. And my sons haven't been able to see their teachers or their friends other than through Zoom. And no matter where we go, we cannot get away. We live in a city of over 8 million people. And so we can't just go outside whenever we want. We don't have a backyard, we don't have a car. And so every day we're stuck in our house, locked away with concerns for coronavirus and the cops. But today we've gone out and I'm hopeful to get out to the street and get on the, to the protest, but having to weave our way through this barricade and the police and we finally get around and the protesters are gone and my sons are tired by this point. So the best I can do is just take them back into our home and open the windows so that they can hear the chants. And I hope that there's another day that I can go out, but my wife is away, so it's gonna be kind of tough. A few days later, I think of a great plan. Somebody has um, been interested in buying my old MacBook. And I think to myself that I can just put on a show for my sons. I can go out, sell the MacBook, join the protest for just a short second in front of our home, and then go back inside before our sons, my son's show even ends. And so I tell my son as I'm leaving the house and set up his show that, you know, he can call me on his iPad if anything happens, um, but I'm just going to be gone five to 10 minutes, just like when I go to the corner store to get milk. And so when I go outside the house, I go to the meeting spot where we're, I'm supposed to meet with the guy to buy the computer and I'm waiting for him there and he starts to text me and he, he can't seem to find where I'm at. And I'm like, that's really weird because I live right by the central hub of transportation in Brooklyn. Everybody knows where this is. And right next to me, there's this gigantic target and a little further down the street, there's the only Best Buy in the area. So it's really weird that the guy can't find me. So I decide I'll just go over to the protest and I'll take some pictures and I'll soak up the energy of everyone chanting and just wait for him to find me. And, but he's taking so much time, I'm getting nervous and I'm just getting ready to say, forget it, it's not worth it. When this black, young black guy with a baby blue do-rag walks up to me and asks if, if I'm Devin. And I'm like, this must be the guy. And I'm like, great, perfect. I was right about to leave. And I, pull, I start pulling out the computer to give it to him, to exchange with him. And it turns out that he didn't bring any money with him. And I'm like, what in the world? Why would you come to buy a computer with no money? If you're going to buy something, you obviously need money. And he's just like, oh, no, it's okay. It's okay. I'll just go inside this Target and get some cash. And I'm like, Target is closed. Like, there's a protest going on here. And there's curfews coming up in a couple hours. All the stores in this area are closed. And he's like, no, it's okay. I'll find an ATM. And at this point, I'm like, he had trouble finding the gigantic Target. I don't think he'll be able to find an ATM. So I'm like, it's okay. You know, we'll just do it on another day. I got to get back home to my kids. And I turn to walk up the street. And as I turn to walk up the street, I see a squad of 20 to 30 police officers walking in my direction. And my face was already obstructed with my mask. So it was hard to breathe. But in that moment, I stopped breathing altogether. I tried to play it cool. And I tried to just walk past them, but I could feel the tension in the air. And I'm scared that if any of them feel the tension in the air and instinctively just react, that this could end really poorly. And I see how poor of a decision I made to come outside. But as soon as I get past them, I'm able to take a deep breath. And I'm just so relieved and I'm just, I gotta get home now. And I'm excited because I'm down the final stretch and I'm crossing the street. And as I'm crossing the street, I see some of the people leaving from the protest, some of my neighbors, 
I see them walking in, just a family of three with their baby in their baby carrier, and they walk right through the barricade, and I'm like, okay, I've made it here. And I get to the barricade, and the cops stop me. They don't let me go through. They tell me I can't come through, and I have to go around. And I explain to them that there's no way to go around it. My house is right there next to the police station. This is the only way through. And even if I walk around the other side, I'm still going to have to go through a barricade. And they make, me, they make me show them their ID, and I'm going back and forth with them, arguing. And I'm like, you just let through some of my white neighbors right in front of me. And finally, after a back and forth, they let me go through, and I feel my heart racing, and I'm marching up the street. And as I get closer to my building, I catch up to my neighbors who are just casually walking, and I see them look over their shoulders one time, two times, three times. And instead of recognition in their eye, I can see that there's fear. I've seen this fear so many times that I know what they're telling me with this. They're telling me that I am a threat. They're telling me that only the Black Lives Matter are the ones that are brutally killed on the street and are recorded. And they're telling me that me and my wife have this huge burden that we have to tell our sons that they are human beings because the world will not. I was so caught up in being outside with the protest and changing the world that I missed the fact that I needed to be inside with my kids, changing their hearts to make sure that they know that they're human. And even for the people who are out there chanting, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter, I know that there's more to the protest than just the protest. There's a protest within our hearts. And I go upstairs and I open the window for my sons to soak up the chant but I also open up my heart and hope that they soak up the chant that says, we are black and we are human. Thank you. Devin, thank you so much for that story. Devin is a published writer, a three-time New York City moth story slam champion, and he's also the founder of an organization called Unreeling Storytelling, a Brooklyn-based true storytelling show providing a platform that sheds light on the repressed perspectives of people of color, women, and other marginalized individuals. Yes, and thanks to all the tellers this evening who, who opened their hearts through their stories. It takes a lot to do this. It takes a lot to tell these stories to anyone and even more courage and dedication to tell it to a room full of strangers, even if it's virtually. COVID may be keeping us apart, but stories and storytellers like this are bringing us together. So to everyone out there, please um, keep sharing your stories wherever you can. Yeah. And a special thanks to you, Paul Carrington, with Fresh Ground Stories. It was a pleasure. And uh, to Melissa Reeves with Story Fruition, who brought us the, a lot of storytellers tonight and coached them along the way and helped shape and craft. Thank you so much for all the work you guys put into this. Tonight's event was recorded and we expect to have it available uh, for sharing on our website, knkx.org. On behalf of KNKX, Fresh Ground Stories and Story Fruition, thank you so much for being here tonight on a Friday night. And thank you again to all of you wonderful storytellers, you talented humans who made this night possible. So be well, be safe. Good night. Thank you.